Professor uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, uh, Professor of Economics and Law at Columbia University, Senior Fellow in International Economics at the Council of Foreign Relations. How do you see the future of agriculture in a world whose population is likely to rise to 9 billion by 2020, 10 billion possibly by 2050? How are we going to feed everyone? Well, I, I, I'm an optimist in terms of technical change. Uh, when you look at the first green revolution, when the new seeds occurred, the, the growth rate of output, wherever it was implemented, because uh, it also needed irrigation, uh, was in the range of 7 to 8 percent per annum, and the growth rate of the population was about 2 percent in India, and the income growth was about 4 percent. So if you take 6 percent, 4 plus 2, it was still kind of you know below uh, what you had with, 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 the, gro with um, the absorption of the new seeds. I think. Uh, Basically, you know, there's so much going on now on GM seeds and uh, there's going to be a whole lot of new technology also developing in relation to climate change, which will have some sort of spillover effects. That I, I remain an optimist. I talk to a lot of scientists because of my interest in, um, in Copenhagen issues. Uh, and you come away really impressed by what by the kind of can-do Obama-style approach, uh, though I hope that won't meet with this Obama-style fate. <laughs> there is a lot of resistance in Europe, though, to um, genetic technology as far as uh, cropping is concerned. We've just had the, the first potato approved, the first GM crop of any sort approved for 12 years by the Commission, the, and that's the Amflora potato, which isn't even for eating. Um, does that discourage you, given that something like 55% of, of GM crops are grown in the States? Uh, I think it's it's going to grow. I mean, you take hormone-fed beef. There was a huge opposition to that in in in, in, in Europe, uh, and it went through like a shot in, um, in 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 America. The cultural differences on technological change are very different between the two countries. I mean, over in Europe, you you regard them as Frankenstein foods. A large numbers of people not. I mean, it's not universal, obviously. But, but that's the predominant tendency on the part of many NGOs, uh, civil society groups of different kinds, even some scientists join in. You don't find that in, 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 in America because in America the attitude to technology is, well, it may lead to problems uh, down the road, but then we'll attack those problems with new technology. So I, I frequently cite a New Yorker cartoon, which, which actually, you know, where there's a guy sitting eating broccoli uh, he's clearly not someone I admire. He's a, a terrible <laughs> vegetable. <laughs> and he's telling the waiter, you know, this broccoli doesn't taste good. Will you go out and get it genetically modified? So they, they, the Americans see technology as solving problems. Most of the, I mean, certainly Europeans see it as creating problems. Uh, and I think there's, there, there is a fundamental difference. But I think the, most of the world outside uh, seems to be a little closer to the American approach uh, than to, to the European approach. Of course, NGOs are a bit like, you know, monkey see, monkey do. If it, it becomes a big issue here, then other people pick it up. And I see my, uh, on, on things like, uh, opening up of Walmart. In America, uh, some of the NGOs and unions in particular don't want to see that because they see that as bringing in cheap Indian and Chinese foods uh, and, and products, which is then they fear will depress their own wages through competition. And Indian NGOs, believe it or not, have actually picked it up from the American NGOs, which is cockeyed because in India, if you export more, you create more jobs, and it's actually good for the country, good for the poor. But there is this monkey see, monkey do approach everywhere. So I think to some extent, the European preferences or in, in this regard have influenced other countries, but they're beginning to wear out. Uh, we're thin because in the end it's not domestic I and mean, there's no Indian really worrying if you are, if you just catch a guy at random really worrying about technical change uh, and you know what is going to do the world I mean his or her view is very limited to their own existence and you know contending with the kinds of conditions you find in India and if you ask them to talk about things in general, you know, bigger issues like Frankenstein foods, it's completely far into uh, to, to their way of thinking. 
but still some NGOs will pick this up and uh, you know I mean a lot of people are just struggling with day-to-day -day lives and so on uh, and in fact uh, I know I mean, if you have any British <laughs> viewers or listeners uh, there was apparently a poll uh, of, uh, after the British had left where people were asked in around because at 47 we got independence and people were asked at around 48, you know, what do you think about the British having left? And then most of the respondents said, who are the British? <laughs> so I, I, in my view, um, I think it will go through. I, I would give it another 10 years. Um, of course, there will be a lot of interaction debate. Even Europe, Europe will, will, will begin to change, in my judgment, because as the world changes, uh, you're going to fall behind basically with low tech you know I mean because it's a high productivity thing it's also good for the environment because when you don't have to use things like pesticides and so on and you you're build developing new seeds which actually you know get rid of the problems which pesticides are, are supposed to be you know taking care of it's good for the environment in, in the broad sense as well so it's high productivity low on environmental expense I think you have to, it's, it's, once you surmount your initial distaste and fears and so on, I think it's going to take in Europe as well. Europeans are smart people. I'm an Anglophile, I was brought up in England, so I can't imagine they would be so foolish as to keep doing this forever. But there's only 1% of the, of the land that's under GM crops at the moment is actually within the European Union. So wow. Europe has a long way to go to catch up, doesn't it? It does, but I think that also gives a, enough scope to do that. And actually, I mean, uh, when you look at the consumption, uh, since, I mean, you, you are importing things from the United States, it's, uh, you're not close to the United States, and U.S., you know, one of the problems about labeling solution, like this is GM, this is not GM, is that it's impossible to operate because you don't know how much GM is entering, you, you, you know, your product through, ver you know, all kinds of inputs and so on which you're using because you have no control over that, you have no knowledge of that, really. And therefore, American firms are totally opposed to using labels because they could be taken to court by an activist NGO saying, you mislabel, you know, you've got more con GM content. And so I think in the end, it's going to be impractical to work with, to say here is GM, here is not GM. So I, it's, it's, I think the, we cannot win if we are on, opposed to GM. Unless some major accident occurs, like Three Mile Island on, on nuclear, but even there, look at what's happening to nuclear energy today. Suddenly it's all behind us, Chernobyl is behind us, Three Mile Island, but because now what has happened is it's not that people love nuclear, but it's because the environmental impact on the carbon content is zero. So again, it's a matter of trade-offs. Okay, maybe I'll have some problem with this technology. Maybe, you know, there'll be a three-mile island happening with real impact, but still, compared with the huge pay payoffs you get, it's worth the, the cost-benefit analysis, you see. So I think these are the kinds of things which will, I think, in the end, push uh, European agriculture into that. And in my opinion, I think, you know, once you're shed, uh, you've given up all the, the problems you have in European agriculture with with all kinds of production subsidies which are beginning to get really cut down. Uh, I think once you, if, if I keep getting subsidy for what I'm doing, <clears throat> I have, I'm going to be in for what I, we call in international economics in relation to protectionism, <clears throat> a goofing off effect. Because you, if you're sheltered from competition, if you just get freebies from the state and so on, why, sh why should you actually shape up? I mean, it's human nature. I mean, you know, I would goof off and, you know, work at my marriage or whatever over the weekends and so on. It's working like a <laughs> someone possessed you, you know, because I face competition. I could be wiped out if I just take a, you know, go up into the countryside and drink Bordeaux and get filmed, you know, by Eric Rover and so on. The French can do it, you know, but, but they also worry now about competition. Everybody worries about competition. So I think once we are, the European agriculture is in a position where it's going to become, have to compete, I'm sure they will because there are lots of advantages. And I mean, Europeans are no slouches. Uh, 